In this lecture, we look at Mao Zedong's effort to dramatically accelerate China's economic development by undertaking a great leap forward. Distrustful of Khrushchev's revisionism, Mao abandoned the Soviet model of socialist construction, and in 1958 he struck out in a new and uncharted direction, hoping to leapfrog the Russians and beat them to the promised land of communism. It was an audacious gamble, and it failed miserably. For various reasons, the Soviet model had not proved to be a very good fit for China. For one thing, Soviet-style socialism spawned economic free riders, as we saw. For another, it was ill-suited to China's demographic and economic conditions. China had little advanced technology for industrial development, few world-class scientists and engineers, little virgin land to bring under cultivation, and a massive unskilled rural population that was still using thousand-year-old farming techniques. The Great Leap began not as a grandiose blueprint for human social engineering, but as a series of ad hoc responses to specific developmental problems. The programs of the Great Leap were often improvised and experimental, and some of them made reasonable sense, at least in theory. All too soon, however, the enterprise spun out of control. The first major innovation, introduced at the end of 1957, involved the mobilization of tens of millions of collective farmers during the slack winter season when the demand for field labor was sharply reduced. Instead of sitting around in their villages through the long Chinese winter, peasants could be put to work building large-scale water conservancy projects, dams, reservoirs, dikes, and canals. The concept was rather simple and dated back to ancient imperial times. Large-scale water conservation projects meant higher, stable crop yields, and stable crop yields meant greater tax revenues for the state. Since China was short on both investment capital and advanced technology, but long on raw, unskilled human labor, idle male laborers were conscripted from the villages to do the heavy work of building water management projects using whatever simple tools they had at hand, shovels, picks, and hoes. In some cases, as many as 10,000 peasants from up to a dozen or more villages were transported to a single work site. Since the distances involved often exceeded 10 or 15 miles, they were too great to be traveled on foot in a single day. So temporary barracks were erected at the work sites, where the laborers would remain for weeks or even months at a time, returning home only infrequently. To maintain discipline and morale among the workforce, a rudimentary military-style regimen was introduced. Workers arose at dawn to recorded bugle calls, ate their meals in communal canteens, and marched in step to the work sites, their tools over their shoulders like rifles. Once there, they synchronized their labor to the sharp, regular rhythms of work chants. Participating laborers received no paid compensation for their work, though meals, housing, and transportation were provided free of charge. Perhaps inevitably, this new militarized form of large-scale labor-intensive conservation work was compared to the Red Army's conduct of People's War during the Yan'an period. In fact, the entire enterprise was now portrayed in the state media as a people's war against nature. And this, in turn, set a militaristic tone for the entire Great Leap Forward to follow. One key feature of the water management campaign was the marked absence of expert scientific or technical input. Blueprints were done on the fly, often by inexperienced draftsmen. Surveying was slipshod. Material specifications were mere approximations based on crude estimates of load-bearing capacities and structural requirements. 
The fact that many of these huge projects later failed or collapsed because of design and construction flaws did not immediately dampen the regime's enthusiasm for the triumph of the human spirit. In the can-do ethos of the Great Leap Forward, expert scientists, engineers, and technical intellectuals were denigrated as useless, impractical bookworms, while the politically mobilized red peasants and cadres were given credit for achieving amazing feats of creativity and daring. With millions of male laborers living on the construction sites, often for months at a time, the spring of 1958 saw a growing shortage of able-bodied farm workers in the villages. As the busy spring planting season approached, women were mobilized to work in the fields. To conserve household labor, domestic chores were now collectivized. Instead of each woman cooking for her own family, a few women would prepare meals for everyone in the village. Child care was also managed on a communal basis, with a few village grannies keeping watch over all the local children. Care for the elderly, sick and disabled, was similarly arranged on a large-scale basis. The net effect of all of this was to free up large numbers of women from the demands of household domestic chores, enabling them to participate in farm labor while the men were away working on conservation projects. Chinese propagandists praised the new system for having liberated Chinese women from household drudgery. But it was women's liberation of a rather strange type, since it involved the swapping of one kind of drudgery for another. By the late spring of 1958, several of these ad hoc innovations had become more or less permanent fixtures in China's collective farms. Communal dining halls were now the norm. They were lauded in party newspapers as a breakthrough for their communist spirit of literally serving the people. In some areas, rural cadres began to experiment with enlarging the scale of the existing collective farms by amalgamating as many as 10 or even 20 neighboring villages to form a single integrated administrative unit with populations as high as 10,000 or even 20,000 people. The mass media were quick to applaud such experiments as the first sprouts of communism. And Mao himself was delighted with the sudden upsurge of enthusiasm for these things that he called newborn socialist things. On an inspection tour of rural Henan province in the early summer of 1958, Mao visited one of these newly amalgamated large-scale collectives. Impressed by the evident enthusiasm of the local peasants and cadres, Mao asked for the name of their new organization. Weixing Ranmin Gumsha, came the answer. The Sputnik People's Commune. On Mao's return trip to Beijing, a reporter from the People's Daily asked the chairman for his impression of this new Sputnik People's Commune. Mao's five-word response, Ranmin Gumsha Hao, People's Communes are good, appeared the next day as a banner headline on the masthead of the Communist Party's flagship newspaper. All over China, rural officials now hastened to emulate the Sputnik experience. Mao had said people's communes are good. Now suddenly, they began to pop up everywhere, like mushrooms after a spring rain. Suddenly, all roads to Weixing were jammed with officials converging from all parts of the country, seeking to learn the secrets of organizing and running a people's commune. Just what was a people's commune? And how did it work? Along with the dramatic enlargement of China's collective farms, extraordinary claims of unprecedented crop yields began to appear in the official media. In areas where people's communes had been formed relatively early, the summer wheat harvest in 1958 was said to have virtually doubled from the previous year. New breakthroughs in productivity were reported almost daily as a wave of unbridled optimism spread like wildfire. 
New innovations in farm techniques now began to be widely reported and popularized. A revolutionary method of planting rice called deep plowing and close planting was promoted in the summer of 1958. The theory behind it was that if two tons of rice could be grown on a given plot of land by planting the seedlings 12 inches apart at a depth of 6 inches, then far larger yields could in principle be achieved by planting the young seedlings twice as close together at twice the depth and with twice as much fertilizer added per acre of rice. To facilitate deep plowing, a new larger type of farm plow was introduced, the two-wheel, two-share plow. Pulled by two fully grown men or a water buffalo, it could dig a furrow up to 18 inches deep. Almost immediately, claims of doubled or even trebled crop yields were reported in the party press as rural officials across the country competed among themselves to meet and exceed established norms of per acre production. A famous photo printed in the People's Daily showed a group of children playing happily on the top of a thick, rich plot of mature rice plants. The plants in the photo were as thick as a straw mattress, and they easily supported the weight of the frolicking children. With the new larger size of the people's communes, it now became possible, at least in theory, to broadly diversify the rural economy. By introducing a large-scale division of labor involving thousands of peasants, the communes could, it was argued, become entirely self-sufficient, not merely in food production, but in industry, commerce, education, and military training as well. No longer bound by the conventional technocratic constraints of the old Soviet model, China was blazing a new and original pathway to the future. Perhaps the most famous example of rural economic diversification during the Great Leap was the notorious campaign to create large amounts of high-quality steel in backyard blast furnaces. Here again, the idea was to substitute large-scale mobilized human labor for the scientific, technical, and capital requirements of making steel in modern urban factories. In launching the new campaign, Mao declared that his goal was to surpass Great Britain in steel production within 15 years. Throughout the countryside, millions of peasants were conscripted to build small-scale clay brick-and-mortar kilns. Operating around the clock, the kilns were fired to superheated temperatures. To keep the furnaces blazing, all available rural fuel supplies were consumed. Whole forests were denuded of trees, and all available household heating and cooking coal was requisitioned. To supply the needed pig iron, scrap metal was collected in every village, including old farm tools, bicycle parts, household pots, pans, and utensils. Anything and everything metallic was fed into the furnaces. Nothing was spared, not even family walks. Working night and day, China's mobilized peasants produced almost 3 million tons of backyard steel in 1958, approximately 15 pounds of steel for every man, woman, and child in rural China. The sudden spike in output represented a 30% increase in the country's total steel production for 1958. A few months later, an obvious an obviously exuberant Chairman Mao revised his goal of catching up with Great Britain from 15 years down to only three. And still the innovations kept coming. One problem that had long plagued rural China was the prevalence of grain-consuming pests, birds, rats, and insects. As part of the Great Leap, a people's war was launched to eliminate the four leading crop-eating pests. In this new campaign, sparrows were designated public enemy number one. To reduce the sparrow population, a low-cost, labor-intensive strategy was devised. Millions of peasants, mainly women and children and the elderly, were mobilized to bang pots and pans and wave sticks and brooms outdoors. 
The resulting din frightened the sparrows out of the trees and fields and into the air. Unable to land because of the intense noise, they would eventually drop from exhaustion, whereupon they were set upon by crowds of people and strung onto garlands, which were then displayed as trophies. Those who killed the most sparrows were given commendation as advanced workers, or Sputniks. Tens of millions of sparrows were killed in this way. By the midsummer of 1958, a national euphoria was in evidence, fueled by extreme claims of success in the people's war against nature and amplified by an overactive communist propaganda machine, China's leaders began to believe that they had discovered a shortcut to communism, the ultimate nirvana. By the end of 1958, the country's 750,000 collective farms had been consolidated and merged into just 23,000 people's communes, each with an average size of 25,000 people. In the excitement of the moment, it escaped notice that many, if not most, of the communes had been set up in haste without much planning or preparation. With Mao already engaged in a contest of egos with Nikita Khrushchev, the Chinese leader was eager to prove the superiority of China's newly discovered pathway to communist perfection. To bolster China's claims that people's communes would hasten the arrival of pure communism, Mao gave his blessing to a new system of income distribution to pay China's communal farmers. Instead of receiving payment proportional to the work they performed, as in the past, commune members now would receive the bulk of their income based on the communist distribution principle of to each according to his need, that is, free supply. In the new system, income entitlements were calculated for different demographic categories, for men, women, children, and the elderly, on the basis of their average daily caloric requirements. At the conclusion of each harvest, 70% of the commune's distributable income would be handed out according to these entitlements without regard to labor contribution. Only 30% was awarded on the basis of work actually performed. To ensure that all remnants of capitalism were thoroughly eradicated in the new communes, the small private plots and domestic animals that individual families had been permitted to retain for their own private use under collectivization were now communized. And rural free markets, where peasants had traditionally sold or bartered their surplus produce, were summarily abolished. Across China, the wind of communism was blowing with gale force. To spur even greater increases in farm output, emulation contests were held throughout the countryside. First, the members of one commune would pledge to double their grain output at the next harvest. Then a neighboring commune would counter-pledge to raise their grain harvest by, say, 125 percent, and so on. Those communes that met or exceeded their pledges were awarded the honorary title of Sputnik. By August of 1958, Central Party leaders had become dizzy with success. Believing that food was abundant, they ratcheted up communal quotas for mandatory grain procurement by the state. Local officials, who were painfully aware that many of the reports were grossly exaggerated, were nonetheless obligated to fulfill the new higher quotas. Clearly reluctant to offend their superiors, they lied to them, inflating their harvest estimates while squeezing every last drop of grain out of the hapless peasants who were forced to tighten their belts just to survive. The result was a national orgy of official exaggeration and unreality at the very top of the food chain, while at the bottom of the chain, hundreds of millions of peasants began to suffer shortages. The engine driving this entire upward spiral of inflated expectations was Mao Zedong himself. 
By the late summer of 1958, Mao had gone all in in his competition with Khrushchev, in effect betting the house on the success of the Great Leap. Because of this, he could not countenance the loss of face that would accompany any acknowledgement of failure. Aware of the intensity of Mao's feelings, his lieutenants dared not question his judgment or dampen his enthusiasm. Meeting in August of 1958 at the seaside resort of Beidaihe, not far from Beijing, Chinese leaders basked in their ostensible success. China's 1958 grain harvest had, it was estimated, exceeded 450 million tons, surpassing even the United States. And party leaders were told that the country could produce as much rice as it wanted to. Mao even went on record as suggesting that everyone should eat not three meals a day, but five. By summer's end, the party's propagandists were proclaiming unprecedented breakthroughs in every realm of human endeavor, from steelmaking and grain production to medical science, even athletic competition. On the ground in the provinces, however, the gap between rhetoric and reality was becoming painfully apparent. Although the initial crop harvest in the summer of 1958 was in fact larger than average, a number of serious problems had begun to emerge. When the first heavy summer rains fell in 1958, many of the dams, canals, dikes, and reservoirs constructed the previous winter began to fail, causing inundation of hundreds of thousands of acres of cropland. Of the 500 largest reservoirs under construction in the winter of 57-58, more than 200 were abandoned within two years. Nor did the Great Leap's water conservation failures end there. In 1975, a huge dam built in 1958 in Henan province during the height of the leap collapsed, causing an estimated 200,000 deaths the largest single dam disaster in human history. The main causes of failure were inadequate engineering know-how and the routine use of substandard construction materials. The Maoist emphasis on mass mobilization over careful planning, on ideological readiness over technical expertise, had created not miracles, but vast misfortune. The 1958 experiment with close planting and deep plowing also proved a failure. Rice seedlings, it turned out, could not be tr successfully transplanted at a depth of more than 10 inches. It tended to kill the del delicate seedlings. And doubling the application of fertilizer per acre tended to burn the young seedlings rather than nourish them. It was later revealed that the famous People's Daily photo that showed children playing on a thick bed of close-planted rice had been faked by local cadres for the benefit of visiting party dignitaries. The backyard steel furnaces were the next to fail. Although large amounts of scrap metal were successfully melted down and forged into crude steel, the resulting products were unusable. The steel's composition was not standardized. Its smelting temperatures varied widely. Its chemical alloys were impure, and its tensile strength was so poor that it tended to crack under stress. Once again, the ascendancy of red ideology over expert planning and engineering had led to failure. To make, to make matters worse, in the obsessive drive to keep the backyard furnaces firing 24-7, the reckless denuding of forests and underbrush from rural hillsides created a severe shortage of fuel for cooking and heating, as well as a massive problem of soil erosion. The effects of these environmental disasters are still being felt in rural China today, some 50 years later. The systematic elimination of grain-devouring sparrows was also of dubious value. Though millions of sparrows were killed, it turns out that the tiny birds devoured their weight in insects. Without sparrows to control the insect population, crop damage was even greater than before. On top of all this, the much-vaunted free supply system introduced in the people's communes 
also turned out to be a failure. With 70% of a commune's income distributed to members without regard for work performed, the free rider problem worsened considerably. The communes were so large and so impersonal, it was virtually impossible to monitor individual work performance, let alone to punish those who failed to pull their weight. Under such circumstances, the incentive to work diligently was further diluted. Field management was done carelessly, planting was haphazard, and mature grain was left to rot in the field. The combination of deeply flawed technical innovations, diminished incentives to work hard, and a false sense of economic abundance and personal entitlement added up to a recipe for catastrophe. With Mao still basking in his late summer euphoria, urging people to eat five meals a day, communal granaries in the autumn began to run dangerously low and meals served in communal kitchens became plainer, sparser, and less appetizing. As one peasant recalled, at first an individual got 18 ounces of food a day, but later there was so little grain in our storehouse that they reduced it to nine ounces. With that, you couldn't even make steamed buns, so they made a soup, a kind of gruel. Complaints began to pour into newspapers around the country, bemoaning the poor quality of communal food and the careless indifference of communal cooks. Rice stalks, wheat chaff, and pieces of corn husk now found their way into communal meals with increasing regularity. And the gruel got thinner and thinner. By the end of the year, the bubble of irrational exuberance had begun to burst. Crop yields in the second half of 1958 were much lower than in the first half. And the adverse effects of the wasteful backyard steel campaign and the ill-advised free supply system were beginning to be felt. Yet quotas for compulsory grain delivery to the state remained unrealistically high. When peasants complained that they couldn't meet their inflated grain quotas, Mao accused them of hoarding and dividing surplus grain among themselves and he ordered rural cadres to search their homes and seize the grain. Caught uncomfortably between the demands of their superiors and the frantic pleas of the commune members, local cadres did as they were told. In many areas, they hired thugs to search peasants' homes for concealed grain, beating up anyone who resisted. In a number of cases, sympathetic rural cadres committed suicide rather than comply with such inhumane treatment. By the winter of 1959, the Party Central Committee and even Mao himself recognized that something had gone seriously wrong. At a meeting in late February, Mao grudgingly acknowledged that leftist excesses had created problems and he now ordered a reduction in compulsory steel and grain quotas and a readjustment of the free supply system to strengthen work incentives in the people's communes. Although Mao gave ground on some of the particulars of the Great Leap, he was too stubborn to acknowledge failure, especially to Nikita Khrushchev. And so even as the grain supply situation became progressively worse, Mao unilaterally stepped up China's exports of grain to the Soviet Union in repayment of Stalin's 1949 loan. In the face of a growing crisis, a few of Mao's lieutenants began to question the inflated claims of success. Previously afraid to speak out for fear of offending the chairman, they now began to raise their voices in dissent. And in the summer of 1959, their newfound courage presented Mao Zedong with the single biggest challenge of his career to date. Next time, Defense Minister Peng Dehuai confronts Chairman Mao. <laughs>